As part of an experiment to explore the human mind, we asked 22 people to solve the same riddle and recorded their responses. Feel free to participate also. Are you ready? Um... The riddle. A father is about to bring his son to a job interview, applying for a position at a large stockbroker's company in the city. Just as they arrive at the company's parking lot, the son's phone rings. He looks at his father who says, go ahead, answer it. The caller is the trading company CEO who says, good luck son, you've got this. The son ends the call and once again looks at his father, who is still next to him in their car. How is this possible? <laughs> he gets a call from the CEO, uh, but it says... Good luck, son. But he was next to him. So it's not the father. I think it was probably an audio recording of his father. Maybe he made it a... Uh... A demo tape? Like, is like he has two fathers? This is a hot one. Maybe it's a word joke, like it's the grandfather of the son. No, I think his name is Son. I don't know. <laughs> Maybe it's just like an old man, you know, calling a younger guy Son. I have no idea. The answer. It's his mother. Ah! Oh, that's... Oh, that's so stupid. Yes, of course. Ah! Ah! I should have thought of that, yes. The CEO is a woman. So I'm, I'm biased. <laughs> In a sense. Is this about diversity and inclusion? That's really mind-blowing, actually. So I always thought that... Uh, I'm not as... Not very sexist. But in spite of that, I think these subconscious biases are there in everyone's mind. How much bias I still have in terms of thinking that the CEO needs to be a man. Yeah, I definitely was picturing a man. They identify with males more than females these days. Why can't women also be CEOs or doctors or, right? When I think about a CEO or, so, or someone that's high positioned within a company, I mostly think of men. And it's a shame, I think. And it's so weird, because I'm a CEO, and I'm a woman. And I want to be a CEO, why didn't I think about that? Crap. I believe uh, women can absolutely be CEOs, and that's definitely something that we should work on, especially when you're saying that so many people have been told this riddle and most people haven't gotten it. Women make great CEOs and great leaders as well. And yet only 5% of Fortune 500 CEOs are women. Let's change our mindset. Oh, fuck. <laughs> Good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. It is a huge pleasure to be back for yet another TL Talks. Um, it's hard to imagine this is our 26th edition. Um, and I am so flattered to be again surrounded by powerhouse, in this case, women. Um, for those that are watching us for the first time uh, or coming back, thank you so much. If you're a travel advisor, hotel owner, IC, if you are part of a DMC, or if you're just a passionate about travel, uh, thank you so much for joining us. It's, uh, it's a huge honor. I know some of you watch it live, but many of you watch it on demand. So if you're on a Saturday morning walk, as Penny does in Australia, or you know, if you're enjoying a cocktail during the weekend or in the evenings, again, thank you so much for joining us. For those that do not know me, I am the founder of TL Portfolio. Uh, I am Brazilian. I grew up in Mexico. Um, and then I moved to Switzerland to study hospitality at La Roche. Um, and after that, I kind of embarked into the luxury travel space. So I worked with the Hyatt in Paris. I then spent uh, almost a year, actually a little bit more than a year, living with seven tribes in Southeast Asia before moving to New York. Did the opening of the Ritz-Carlton Battery Park. I worked with the Mark. At the time, it was part of Mandarin Oriental. I was invited to join Four Seasons in Singapore, which I lived for almost three years and loved it. 
moved to Turks and Caicos to manage a boutique independent property before joining Sotheby's Real Estate and working with developers and eventually moved on to Miami, opened my first consultancy business before returning to Brazil to help head the sales and marketing of Ponta dos Ganchos, which is another fabulous independent property in Brazil. In 2012, I opened uh, TL Portfolio, which is a sales and marketing representation and PR uh, firm with offices throughout North and South America. I'm very, very proud to say we're all, we're an all women's team. We're 17 women. Uh, I have tried to hire men. I think the female power is a little intense. I had one story which I'll share, which one of our, um, he was a, a, an assistant sales um, executive and um, he said he would go out to buy cigarettes and never came back. Believe it or not, it's a true story. So, <laughs> so anyway, I hope you enjoyed the little riddle that we played. I think uh, it catches some of the most, you know, pro-female feminist, uh, you know, kind of modern thinkers. It's crazy what we carry in our subconscious. Um, so if you enjoy these talks, our purpose since we started in April has been to send out some positive energy, help the industry, bring about some of the leaders in our industry to motivate and inspire and kind of send out um, a lot of energy, which is what we need more than ever today. So again, thank you for joining. If you enjoy it, please subscribe to our YouTube channel and share it. The more people we can hit with positive energy, the better for all of us. So I'm going to go ahead and introduce our panel. Uh, we have here three incredible women. Uh, Tina Edmondson, she's the Global Officer Brand and Marketing for Marriott International. Tina oversees 30 diverse and experiential hotel brands. And um, as well as the brand loyalty portfolio marketing, in addition to marketing channels and optimization. Tina is setting a new industry standard for creation, creativity and innovation in experiential luxury and lifestyle travel. She plays a crucial role in helping ensure that each brand remains culturally, culturally relevant and resonates with the diverse and evolving mindset of travelers around the world. And this is the amazing thing. Tina oversees a portfolio that includes the Ritz-Carlton, the Ritz-Carlton Reserve, Bulgari um, in Hotels and Resorts, the uh, St. Regis Hotels and Resorts Edition, the Luxury Collection, JW Marriott and W Hotels. I mean, it is massive um, and it's just incredible. Uh, she's a graduate of the University of Bombay in India and earned an MBA in Hotel and Restaurant Administration at the Conrad Hilton School at the University in Houston. She currently resides outside Washington, D.C. with her husband and daughter, Tina. Uh, firstly, congratulations on an incredible career. And secondly, thank you so much for joining us. It's, it's amazing to have you here. Um, we also have Lindsay Uberoff, uh, who's the CEO of Preferred Hotels and Resorts. Uh, since joining the company in 2004, Lindsay has helped solidify the position of Preferred Hotels and Resorts as an iconic global hospitality brand. In March 2015, Lindsay spearheaded the rebranding of hotel, uh, Preferred Hotel Group to Preferred Hotels and Resorts, which represented an onset of a new consumer-facing strategy for the company. Highlighting the success of the strategic move, in the same year, Lindsay led the company to achieve a major milestone in its history by generating a billion dollars in reservations revenue on behalf of the hotel uh, members worldwide and 15% increase over previous years. So, Again, it's not about, you know, how you get there. It's about women that work their butts off, that know what they're doing and that achieve results. So this is amazing. She has received back-to-back -back accolades in 2015, first with the Hotel Magazine as one of the top uh, 10 most noteworthy hoteliers in the world, then by the Lodging Magazine of one of the 20th most influential females in the lodging industry. Um, and bef before joining Preferred Hotels, Lindsay was the account executive as Ambassador International Global Meeting and Incentive Company. And prior to that, she was in the management consulting at Anderson Consulting, which is Accenture. Um, she's an active member of the U.S. Travel Association and the Young Presidents Organization, a graduate of Wake Forest University. Lindsay has traveled to more than 100 countries. Lindsay, such a pleasure to have you here. You'll have a very strong following in our industry. You have people who adore you and have been sending me messages that they're so excited to watch you. So again, thank you so much for joining. My pleasure. Another, uh, you know, another person that people are very eager to hear, all three of you, but another name that vibrates in the industry, uh, Maria Schollenberger, travel editor at large for How to Spend It. 
Maria is a long-serving travel editor of How to Spend It, the multi-award-winning luxury supplement of the Financial Times. She oversees all the travel content for the magazine and writes features across other topics, such as the FT Weekend's Life and Arts and House and Home pages. She has been editor-at-large for Condé Nast Traveler and senior editor at Travel and Leisure, the two leading luxury travel brands in the United States. She also contributes to numerous other U.S. publications, such as the New York Times, Style Magazine, Town and Country, Departures, El Decor, Architectural Digest, and so on. She lives between London and Italy and is speaking to us today from Rome. So, ladies, again, thank you so much. I had to shorten your bios because I could keep on going for an hour about <laughs> each one of you. So sorry if I had to cut back a little bit, but um, it's a pleasure to have you here. I wanted to start, and maybe I'll start with you, Tina. Um, can you share with us, for those that don't know you personally, a little short elevator pitch on your career? And then at the end, tell us who are the women that inspire you? Sure. And thanks again, Tina, for having us. It is truly an honor to be amongst these amazing women. I'm, I'm humbled. Um, so, you know, as you mentioned, um, I was uh, I was born and brought up in India and I moved uh, or I came to the U.S. actually just to go to school. I was fully intending, um, you know, to go back home. I got my master's degree and uh, at a college fair, um, I uh, landed a job with uh, what was then ITT Sheraton. I, you may remember uh, Sheraton as that company. Um, so uh, I started working there with their you know, part of their master's program. Um, and I'm going to digress for a second. A couple years into this, um, I happened to be on a, on a flight, on a Southwest Airlines flight going from Dallas to uh, New Orleans. And I sat next to, and you know, Southwest Airlines, it's free seating. Um, I happened to sit next to this really cute guy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, was, that was about 25 or 26 years ago. Um, I, I ended up marrying him. Anyway, um, we'll, we'll, we'll touch on that a little bit later, but back to the career part. Um, so I worked uh, probably the next eight to ten years in um, in hotel operations, um, you know, in all sorts of roles. I was a director of revenue management. I was a front office manager. I worked in sales, you know, on and on. Uh, in 1998, when um, Starwood was formed, when Barry Sternlich bought, uh, remember, brought, uh, bought Sheraton and Weston, I had an opportunity to actually go work at the corporate office for Starwood. And so I did. I, I left and, and went to New York. Um, and then held multiple jobs. Uh, you know, I was a VP of rooms uh, at one point. I, you know, I was uh, supporting the Sheraton brand at another point. Did a did multiple jobs, and then um, ended up doing a lot of sort of lateral moves. And and somebody uh, who I respected a lot told me, hey, you know, one of the things that you should do is go go back and be a general manager. And so I decided to do that. I, I was a general manager at the Western Philadelphia, uh, and I did that for a few years. And then a few years later, you know, my hotel got sold. And so I was on the hunt for another job. And at which point I had an opportunity to either go, you know, continue on and, and uh, go be a GM at another hotel or to join the W brand as a, as a vice president. And I had, uh, up to that point, not really had much experience in brand or marketing or uh, certainly W at that point. Um, so it was risky, but I decided that, you know, I wanted to do something different. Um, and I did, and I'm so glad I did. Um, learned a lot. You've been with Marriott for a very long time. I have been. <laughs> that, that, that part is true. Um, and, and anyway, after, after I finished with W, I got a call at that time, um, this is 2008, uh, Marriott did not own uh, Starwood yet. So I got a call from Marriott uh, to join Marriott, and I did, and I was running one brand. I, I came to Marriott to, to run the Renaissance brand. Ten years later, um, you know, Marriott acquired Starwood, or I should say eight years later, Marriott acquired Starwood. And so here I am today running 30 brands, uh, which included the, you know, the brands that I knew at Starwood plus the Marriott brands. So it's been quite a journey, but fun along the way. 
Yeah, no, amazing, incredible. And if you had to say, yeah. which, uh, think about a woman that inspires you. Can, what's, who comes to mind? You know, I would, I would say my mom, and I'll tell you why. Um, so, as I mentioned, I grew up in India, and my mom um, was an entrepreneur in a country that is pretty male-dominated. And she ran beauty salons. And I, you know, growing up, I, I always thought that that was the coolest thing because she was kind of like you, right? Her, her own boss. Um, she, and, and she did that so that she was able to balance her, um, you know, her, her ambitions, if you will, with her family. Um, and she got up to a point of, you know, she, she was running five or six beauty salons in India. And I thought that was really, really cool. And so I think it goes it, for sure. And, you know, it's about the multitasking, right? It's it being able to do so many things. Um, uh, Maria, tell us a little bit about, you know, your your story and, um, and who inspires you. Um, my story, I actually, I mean, I always wanted to be a magazine editor and ideally a magazine editor at a travel magazine. Like if you'd asked me when I graduated from university, what my dream job was, I would have been an editor at, you know, a Condé Nast traveler. Um, and wow, I moved. That, you hit you hit the nail on the head when you <laughs> well, had, when you dreamed it up. Sixteen years later, it was a very <laughs> cute. You know, I ended up. I, I just I moved to New York in the early '90s, and the job market was pretty dicey for all of us. I mean, I had friends who graduated from Harvard who were like calling lattes at Starbucks in San Francisco. I was like, I'll, I better get out of San Francisco. And I went to New York and interviewed, actually did interview for a very long time for an editorial assistant job at Gourmet Magazine when Gail's Wigenthal was editing it. But, you know, it was just the most beautiful magazine, which had a really robust travel lifestyle component. Now, I thought this is pretty much the dream job. But it was the old Condé Nast where you had to go in and take the typing test. And then this person had to meet you and you sort of every two weeks I was interviewing. And meanwhile, my best friend from university had gotten a job as a copywriter at McCann Erickson, the advertising agency. And she said to me, well, you know, you got to make some money. I mean, you're sitting around like, go meet my headhunter. And there's just the advertising agencies are dying for people like us. And so kind of on a whim, I just went and interviewed at Young and Rubicam and I went and interviewed at Gray and I, every single one of them sort of, I'd go in on a Thursday and on Monday I'd have the job offer, you know? And by the way, they paid significantly more than Condé Nast did at the time. So just as a matter of sheer practicality, I kind of had to take a job at a certain point. So I went and worked at Gray Advertising for a few years and then sort of two or three years, and then segued over to McCann Erickson, where I was a television producer for a while, which is sort of very far from what I ended up doing, but was incredibly fun. Um, and then the internet kind of happened, the first wave, like late 90s of the internet happened. And you guys all probably remember kind of everybody, like people from publishing were dragged to be content developers and people from marketing were dragged in to, to do promotion and, and commercial aspects of those jobs. And it was like spin art, you know, everybody went in and it was like, oh, the internet. And then you popped out and had a completely different role or remit. And so when I was, I got a job at an internet company from McCann Erickson, met a woman called Martha McCulley who had co-founded Allure magazine she left the company we were working for to be the executive editor of InStyle. And Martha, by the way, is on my short list of the women you're going to ask me about who I admire the most. She's like a fairy godmother, a mentor, a powerhouse These in her own right. These people are so important, women or men. It makes yeah. all the difference yeah. in our careers. Yeah. And she took me to InStyle. And from InStyle, I went to Real Simple magazine for a while which was like the Harvard Business School of Magazines. It was so well run that Kristen Van Ogtrop, who was the editor at the time, was also very brilliant. Um, and then I made it to Travel and Leisure from there, working for Nancy Novograd, who you know. Probably. Who I adore, mm -hmm. who is yeah. brilliant and a powerhouse and a visionary yeah. and just awesome. Yeah, so along with my mom, Tina, um, <laughs> that that is you know, I've, I've been incredibly fortunate to have a handful of women like that who've really helped, you know, lead me along and walk so we could run and all those great things. How, how, how important it is those, you know, to find those, you know, fairy godmothers uh, along the way. Yeah. Uh, Lindsay, tell us a little bit about your story as well. 
Well, if you had asked me when I was a, a child if I would be the CEO of a travel company, I would have told you no. I think I had asked, I was, and nobody also believes this, I was actually a very, very shy child. I, I was born in Southern California. I remember when I was in second grade, my teacher used to line up the classroom and pretend like they were winding me up to get me to talk. Um, but but through, a, through a series of, uh, of, of, of interesting twists and turns, uh, I, I say I was born into the travel industry. My mom was a flight attendant for TWA. My father's always worked in travel. So I, I, was, I was blessed as a child to, um, to, to travel quite a bit. And my mom is one of those inspirational people as well who um, was just bold and, and, and fearless and would, and we'd laugh now. She would send, she sent my brother and I to survival camp in South Africa and super camp in the Soviet Union. And she made us do things that, you know, at the time seemed pretty normal, but now I reflect upon it. I think that was absolutely crazy. And, but thank God she did, right. She was just, uh, she was just a very bold and brave woman and still is to this day. But, um, so, so my journey to, to where I am was was interesting. We moved quite a few times. Um, so I think people thought I was a military brat, but we weren't. It was just because my father was in travel. He ran an airline. So we moved quite a bit. So by the time I got to college, um, we didn't have a family business. I was, inter- I was interviewing for all sorts of, of jobs, ended up at Anderson Consulting, which is now Accenture, and their change management dis- division, which I think suited me well. I'd moved so many times. I think I, I was really good at change. And um, was was forced to get out of my uh, my shy shell, and um, you know, fast forward a few years later, my father was acquiring a series of travel related companies, um, trying to merge them, and that's how I accidentally went to go work for my father because um, I was really good at change management. So you know, he was it was a bunch of incentive companies and 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 large meeting companies. So you know, next thing I knew it was, it was something I'd grown up with. And now I was in the travel, travel space and thought it was fascinating. Um, I, I loved it. Um, and, you know, a few years later when he then went on to acquire what's now preferred hotels and resorts, again, my father was smart. He never asked me, um, if I wanted to come work for the company, he always said, why don't you come on a few meetings with me? I'd love to, I'd love to get your insight. And it was like it was like a big hook in my mouth, right? I felt hook, line, and sinker, um, you know. To now all of a sudden, you know, be involved in a company that was working with beautiful independent luxury hotels all over the world, um, and 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 at that point in time, Preferred was in a lot of financial trouble too. So, um, you know, I think there's there's something about a challenge, right? And you know, that was now 17 years ago, and I wore every hat in the company. Um, so I did not start out as CEO. And, you know, so by the time um, I finally got to this position, I, I always say it's, it's nice when you can say, nobody can look at you and say, you don't, you don't know what it's like. It's like, no, I've, I think I've, I've done every single role like Tina, Tina was saying, and Maria, you know, when you, when you've been able to sit in, in all those seats and, you know, walk in everybody's shoes, um, I think that makes a big difference. So sure. that's my, my short version, hopefully. Yeah, no, Lindsay, it's phenomenal. It? Sorry. Isn't it funny? My uh, mother was a tra- was a flight attendant too, so it feels like you know we've been in the travel you know travels in our blood in a way. Yeah. Absolutely. We I used to joke family vacations. We'd go visit hotels, not churches and museums. You know, it was just sort of this <laughs> this thing we did as a family. No, it's and and you know I think it, it's so incredible how important the mother role is. You know, and you know I think back and. People ask me constantly, you know, Tina, how can you stay so positive? You know, this TL talks and it's all about sending positive energy. And I, I have the same. I have such incredible, strong women in my family. You know, I look back, my mother's grandmother survived Auschwitz. And I always think if that, if she mm. could survive that, that this is a, this is a piece of cake. You know, this, this is nothing. Um, and so I think we get strength from our leaders and um, men and women will f- often, you know, call upon their, their mothers uh, and, and the, the, the role, the ultimate leadership role in life, right? Um, Tina, I think, you know, as time goes by and everybody's talking about how trends have been accelerated and we see that more and more women, especially over the last few months or a year, have really been moving towards, you know, helping each other. There's been a little bit more unity. There's been more understanding of what the term feminism means, right? There was a Brazilian journalist who said, you know, feminism is not the contrary to machism. It is not a vengeance. It is not resentment. It's not a war. It is simply the equality uh, between men and women. And when you, when you and I first spoke, uh, 
you know, you, you echoed a lot of that. You said about the importance of women supporting each other, but you also said something that I thought was very interesting. You said that women are not aiming high enough. And I would love for you to elaborate yeah. a little bit on that. I was interested yeah. to hear about that too, Tina, when you said that. <laughs> <laughs> glad glad uh, you joined us, okay. Maria. Yeah. You know, I think that you know, if you listen to our uh, backgrounds and, and, you know, as we've talked about, you know, Lindsay talked about being shy. Um, I was a very shy child as well. You know, many women are, you know, tend to be more introverted. And it, the, the fact is that uh, while I think, uh, you know, today, today certainly when I look back 20 years ago, women are so much more supportive of each other in the workplace. And I think that's wonderful. And we need to continue to do that, right? And we need to do it actively, not just passively. We need to go out of our way to do it. Mm -hmm. uh, well, why? Well, because I think we need to push ourselves. We need to push each other because it, uh, for many of us, it doesn't come naturally. We're not as confident. We're not as prepared to go out there. We're not as prepared to take risks. We tend to be, um, you know, a bit more conservative and we tend to be a, a bit more, we pull back more than we push forward. Um, and, you know, in, in some cases, it's a bit of a learned behavior. And I think in a, uh, in a community that is, com that is very supportive of other women, I think women can thrive better. And so I would, just, I would urge us to, to take it on sort of as a mission um, to be active in our pursuit of supporting other women. Yeah. And I, and I think when you mentioned aiming high, it's really, you know, I think when, when, when we spoke, you talked about, you know, look, speaking to women that are starting in their careers or that, and you go, well, how, well, how far do you want to go? And they'll, they won't go all the way up to the CEO. They kind of stop somewhere. And you, and you mentioned it to me, it's like, why, why, why stop there? Why not aim all the way up to the stars, you know? And, and I think, again, you know, the little riddle that we put at the beginning of this, of this That's talk right. speaks to our subconscious. It speaks to, you know, generations of saying, this is the limit. And, and actually it's all about breaking it. And you have done exactly that. You definitely broke that glass ceiling. No, no doubt about that. Um, it's, it's, uh, I th well, I think there's this belief, though, that's that's now been challenged, which is that you can't have it all. Meaning, can you be a CEO, have a family, have balance? You know, there there used to be this concept that, and and if you're going to be a, a a woman, that you're not going to be feminine. You're going to be a ball buster of some sort, right? So, so right. I think that, that that there was this philosophy around that, which is changing, but I think it still has, you know, it, it still has some challenges to it. And I agree with you, as women, you know, we we need to to push each other, you know, to, to break all those stereotypes. And can I ask you to repeat, we, you said something earlier on that you hate, you know, you kind of hate when people ask you, what is it like to be a woman CEO? I loved your answer. You know, can you repeat that? It's my least favorite question to get asked. And I always say, I think it's just like being a male CEO. I just get to wear dresses and skirts. So <laughs> the job is still the same. You know, the role is still the same. We just bring a different set of skills to bear in some cases, but um, yeah, I look forward to when that doesn't, that's not a question we get asked anymore. Certainly. Um, Maria, you've, like all of us, traveled nonstop uh, until the world kind of felt like it stopped spinning, right? Um, so you were traveling, you were on the road to, you know, visiting places as far as Eastern Indonesia, Mozambique, Mongolia, and so forth. And so you have really been uh, observing, writing, reading, researching, um, different cultures, examining them, which are very different than the one that most of us are accustomed to, which is the Western culture. How do you believe uh, this has influenced and changed your ideas about female leadership? Oh, um, well, I think that, I mean, we, we touched on this briefly earlier, that where Lindsay and Tina act, like your professional theater, is the day-to-day -day what you do, how you're figuring out how to mentor women, how you see how to amplify voices and 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 um, create opportunities and shift paradigms even. Um, you're you're active in that. What what I do, what other people in my milieu do is, or I shouldn't speak for them, what I do is, I mean, observe. That's the job, you know? I mean, it's definitely, um, most of my travels in my adult life have been by myself, you know, for work. It's very rare that I brought someone along for work. 
my ex-partner, once or twice we went to a hotel and he was Mr. Schallenbarger and he was like, yeah, no, I'm not into that. <laughs> I don't like that. I'm not coming on one of these again. Um, but you, you know, you realize, obviously you realize, and you guys travel enough internationally to have seen this in Tina, you grew up in India. You know, there are, there are, there are very different paradigms for what female leadership is, how women find ways to have agency in their daily lives, in their communities, in their economies, right? Um, definitely what, what I feel like my role is, is to observe and report and try to find the people, whether they are men or women, and there are some amazing operators out there, there are guys leading charges in different parts of the world um, to help women become proactive in their communities and be these leaders. Um, and then report back in stories, in the newspaper, in how to spend it, in whatever. I, I write a lot for um, the Australian for their luxury supplement, which is called Wish. And you know, it's part of a greater uh, remit that I think a lot of us feel we have to have more, we, we have more urgently than we did 10 or 15 years ago, which is people have to choose responsibly when they're traveling, irrespective of where they're going and whether they want to go flop on a beach or go on a safari or rent a pinisi and be in the back of beyond in Raja Ampat. Like there, there needs to be a component of doing it the right way, doing it responsibly, whether you're, sure. whether you're contributing to conservation or a local community, however that manifests. Um, and because I'm a woman, it's certainly not something I always focus on, but because I'm a woman traveling alone a lot, it's a, it's a reality for me, you know? I mean, so we have this conference that you guys all know about called Pure Life Experiences, mm -hmm. which probably a lot of the people watching know about as well, where we all go and talk about experiential travel in Marrakesh. We had and, Serge on the TL Talk, uh, so he's, he's oh, been off. Yeah. Uh, well, they, you know, they've, they've actually, and I wanted to touch on this later, they've, the, the guys who put together things for the editors at Pure have introduced some of us to extraordinary programs. Um, so they really care and do a good job. But, you know, it's this incredibly glamorous four-day, five-day thing, whatever it is. But in and among it, you know, if, if I'm in town or I go into the Medina to do something or I travel to the south to Warzazat, you're a woman alone in a country where it's pretty weird to be a Western woman alone sometimes, you know, but shockingly so considering how sophisticated Marrakesh is, that you still have these experiences where, like once I got into a taxi and the driver um, stopped and like picked up a friend of his while I was <laughs> back and like, took his friend to his friend's destination first, it was as if I didn't exist. And I was like, this just yeah. wouldn't happen to a guy. It just, <laughs> no. It's so happened not, to me. I'm, I'm being glib about it, but these are things yeah. that, that then work their way into your overall sort of catalog experiences that you think about sure. when you write. No, for um, sure. But you know the so I don't. I mean, I'm not I'm not on staff at the newspaper anymore, so I have to be more creative about the way I try to help younger women. Um, it's yeah. more it's more the reader who I can sure. speak directly to. Sure, uh, just, but you're yeah. you're definitely making waves. Whatever it is you're doing, it's working. Just keep keep at it. Um, <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Thank but Lindsay, I think um, Maria touched upon a point that I think you are uh, doing incredible work. Which which, and I know that you can't uh, talk about it in in its full glory. But yeah. uh, I know that sustainability is something you're very passionate about. You, I've read articles. My team did a, does a lot of research before these talks. You did a trip to Brazil. You were involved in a sustainability project. Um, and it is something that you're, you're passionate about. And you're looking right now at doing a partnership with uh, Costas Kreis, who we adore, who was on our talk recently, um, which I think is so... Uh, innovative it's so much what everybody should be doing and you partner with the right person at the right time to build something that is incredible and so though you can't speak about it because i know it's about it's still to, to happen so we can't you know give a spoiler alert but can you tell us a little bit about why now and uh what is behind this motivation you know because how much did COVID play a part in this can you just give us a little background because it is extremely visionary yeah, you know, it, it's so at Preferred, we, we'd had a program called Gifts, this 
good ideas for today and tomorrow's society. And it was this whole concept of we had hotels that were doing amazing things around the globe in the area of sustainability, community service, and philanthropy. And, and we felt if we could, you know, share what they were doing, kind of good ideas multiply and that that whole concept. About a year and a half ago, I, I got introduced to Coastist at Virtuoso in Las Vegas. And, and you know how you just, you meet somebody and it was like, there was such alignment of our values and our, and our, our, our vision, you know, I mean, his, our, our, the first line of our manifesto, our ideology is, is believe in travel and the power of travel. And, and, you know, obviously this, this whole idea that you can do good. And we were talking about how we, nobody talks about how do you be a good guest? And that's really what Maria was talking about. How do you, how can you create a kinder, kinder, gentler way to travel and experience? Explore our beautiful world, but our fragile universe. And this idea we had before COVID hit, but I think what COVID made us realize is when people start to travel again, they're going to care even more about how they travel, why they travel. And then ultimately it, the hotels that they're staying at, what are they doing? But it's not just what's happening in the, the four walls of their building, you know, the sustainability practices are taking place, but how are they supporting their local community? Are they hiring locally? Are they sourcing locally? Are they you know, is there gender equality in their hiring practices? And then also, how are they celebrating the cultural and heritage of, of those destinations? Because that's true sustainable tourism. And then the, the fact that making money is not a bad thing, because the more money you make, the more that you can put into all of those facets. So um, that's really kind of the, the driving force behind it. And I think that COVID's kind of given us a unique window into what isn't a fad anymore. This isn't a trend. This is, this is as Costas would call it, it's a revolution. And um, I think all of us that, that travel and are in this industry um, believe so strongly in it. So no, we're, we're no. excited about what we're doing. And I just know that there's so many organizations and hotels and people that are doing amazing work in this space. So how do you really elevate the, that leadership? Yeah, and I, and I think it, it goes to really being able to find those that are truly and and truly investing in yes. a sustainable world, be it economic, be it, you know, environmental, what it, whatever the form is. And right now, it's very hard for a traveler or even a travel advisor to be able to pinpoint who really, truly is sustainable because, mm -hmm. you know, words, you know, Maria, you can do wonders with words. And then at the end, it's very hard to be able to dissect the, you know, what's really behind it. And so eventually I would imagine a beautiful thing is to actually have a trusted organization with somebody that is at the forefront of sustainable, uh, you know, genuine truth to be mm -hmm. able to say, yeah. guys, these are the ones, you know, it's like, oh, thanks. You know, cause uh, it's hard. Well, it's hard to say, guys, these are the ones or guys, I'm going to take you there and show you. Yes. you know, yeah. That is, that is like, you have like, we were talking earlier about Deb Kalmeyer, who has Roar Africa, you know, created them, I think, three or four years ago, maybe in 2016. She inaugurated a women's empowerment retreat in Africa, where she takes very high powered women in, in prominent leadership positions, most of them American, I think, like Pilar Guzman, who edited Condé Nast Traveler for a long time, went on one of them. Um, and, you know, her mantra is conservation will will thrive even more than it does now if African women are empowered. You know, understanding their, their ways for them to be empowered within their own communities, within their own economies, um, does nothing but help those countries and those yeah. economies. Um, and showing people practical ways to make that happen and, and bringing these issues that these these women in in you know New York and San Francisco and Chicago would otherwise probably never know about, and nothing is more effective as anyone who's ever gone to a beautiful place and learned about a conservation story knows. Nothing is more effective than seeing it firsthand, and having it spoken to in a way that you understand, that is compelling, that is a narrative that you want to sort of continue to be involved with long after you've left the place. And that's what a lot of these people do well. And it's an enormous amount of work. I mean, she spent years, she, she sponsors girls from Zimbabwe to go to the Hospitality Academy in South Africa. But then after that, it's not like they're just hung out to dry. She goes to hotels and says like, you're not putting these girls in housekeeping. You are putting them on a track to have management leadership positions. And that's, that's like elbow grease, you yes. know? And, and yeah. so our job is to then say world, these are the people you should, you know, go with. For and sure. it's just women. I mean, um, Tina, do you know Harry Hastings from Plan South America? 
He's a no, based operator. He does really, really, we, he's great on all things Central and South America. And in a lot of the countries that he operates in, there are, they're working with women's collectives and, and women in indigenous communities to not just like produce crafts to sell worldwide, but creating models where these women are, are stakeholders in these companies, that it's, it, all, it all is them. So creating leadership models. Um, no, and, and you and I get what you're, you're participating in that, which is yeah. And what you're touching upon is is crucial, right? It's the empowerment of women. It's supporting, and it's funny. I'm wearing a necklace that I bought in Rwanda from a women's community. Uh, you know that were taught how to do ceramics and then put it in a little thing. And so it's funny. I travel the way they're like, that's beautiful. I'm like, it's from a little community in Rwanda that is about moving women forward. Mm -hmm. You know, and uh, <laughs> it, it's it's very important. And I think. I wanted to go back to, to Tina because I think Tina, when I said that you broke the the, the glass ceiling, to me personally, um, and you know Arnie, his vision and his um, in, how he embraces women in leadership is is fundamental. I mean, you know, I told a little bit of my story, and I was for many years in that corporate world. And to be very honest, one of the reasons why I moved on to to an entrepreneurial role is because I had, you know, there were a few women in leadership, general managers and so forth. But when I would look up, I would notice that they all made huge decisions. They had to really give up uh, a big part of their lives. And, and I have to say very few of them uh, have your story, you know, living outside of Washington with her husband and daughter, you know? And when I spoke to, to Stephanie, who's the CEO of Marriott International, I spoke to her in her home with her kids, you know? And I thought that's, brilliant you know because you don't you shouldn't have to give that up and so firstly you know it's it's so nice to see all this because women like myself or girls or starting will have people to look up to women to look up to without having to give up so much and so i, I wanted to know from you do you think that you know things are really moving in that quote corporate ladder fast enough? And two, is it, has technology helped? One of the things, as I said earlier, you know, women tend to be more versatile, you know, they tend to be able to do a million things at the same time. Um, and sometimes it really helps to be at home. I opened TL Portfolio eight years ago with that structure. For me, it was always like that. I always told my team, I don't care where you are, what you're doing, these are your objectives. This is what I need you to deliver from wherever, you know, I don't care. But that was seen as so crazy. It was so modern. And do you think that with this new technology, it will actually catapult uh, the possibility of more women in senior roles? I definitely think um, that technology will help. I think what we have all experienced over the last oh, eight months now um, has changed paradigms, right? It's changed your expectation of, how to do meetings or travel or, uh, you know, how, how much do you physically have to be there versus not? Certainly even from an office perspective, it would shock me if people would go back to a Monday through Friday situation, you know, every day in the office. I think that this, this pandemic is going to change people's behaviors, period. Um, I think the technology and the, the fact that all of us were forced to almost overnight figure it out, right? Figure out the technology, figure out how we could work uh, virtually will definitely help because it'll give women the flexibility that they need to have because they are running their homes and they are, you know, they are, they are uh, moms and they are business women and they are wives and, and they are wearing multiple hats. So I think technology plays a huge role. But I also, but I think that there are also some other fundamental things, right? One is um, to be honest with you, I wouldn't be able to do what I do if I didn't have a very supportive husband, right? And so he, um, he's an entrepreneur much like you, right? So he has flexibility in his schedule. He has flexibility and has had flexibility while my daughter was growing up, right? He's had flexibility from a location standpoint. And funnily enough, because we were just talking about this, he actually, um, uh, helps a working women's co-op in Nepal, and he makes accessories. Um, his company's name is Earth Divas. So it's women. Wow. Right? And, and his mantra is, uh, you know, not to, not to give money, but to help them with a trade so that they can sustain their families. Um, but but, but his, his work has allowed me to have, uh, you know, a, a, a 
call it a nine to five or, or you know, be able to actually do the work that I do. And then I think the third thing that is quite important is what we started this conversation with, which is the workplace has changed. And I think people are, in general, much more empathetic. People understand the role of families and the need to balance. And so I think, again, when I think back to when I started my career, I think uh, girls that are starting their careers today are in a much um, happier place and, and can, uh, and I hope, will get to uh, all kinds of, uh, you know, whether it's CEO or whatever, aim high. Right. Don't aim low, aim high, take risks and they will get there because they are, I think, better equipped because of uh, society, because of technology, because of family um, to be able to get there. So I think they can have it all. Yeah, no. And you, you mentioned an important point, which is, you know, it, it used to be the same or still is behind every successful man is an even stronger woman. And as women move more and more to leadership, it's the same thing, you know, behind every very successful woman is a very supportive man, you know, because for, in my case, it's the same thing. I have an incredibly supportive husband and otherwise none of this would be possible. Um, Lindsay, tell us a little bit about you. You're, you know, you're a CEO of Preferred Hotels and Resorts, which is a family-owned business. And I'm sure, and I've read about articles and that a lot of people think they assume it's a much easier job for you to, you know, to, for a much easier position for you to reach because it was your dad, it's your dad's business or your family business. Um, how do you deal with those assumptions? Because a lot of, if it's not that one, we all deal with some assumptions. When I was opening TL Portfolio and I never worked so hard in my life, it just, I, I would compare it to now. People would think, well, you know, I got a lot of people saying, well, it's easy for you, you have a rich husband. I don't have a rich husband, <laughs> you know? I don't know where that came from. I'm like, I, what, is, what, is, what do they have to do with the other? So there's always assumptions, real or not, and usually not. Um, but you have to deal with them. And how, you know, can you tell us a little bit about that? And also, how would you uh, um, offer some guidance or tip for women that are either starting or that they're struggling to, to, to pass that ceiling that, you know, all of us have been able to break? Sure, yeah, and I think I, I was lucky in, in the sense I told you, we, I, when I was growing up and when I first graduated from college, I, we didn't have a family business. So I, I always tell people that if, if they're thinking about getting into a family business, go get some outside experience is the, the first and best thing that you should do. And I mean, it's, it's, it's a best practice. But yeah, there's this belief that you're overpaid and underqualified. And I, and I always laugh because I in most family businesses, I think you're actually underpaid and overqualified. So you have to work, you know, 10 times as hard to prove yourself, which I don't know that that's necessarily a, a bad thing. You know, I mean, I think that that's, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm proud of the hard work I put into it, but I think you just have to be comfortable with the fact that that's, that's going to be people's assumptions. And as I mentioned earlier, that's why it was so important to me to, to work in so many different departments throughout the company so that by the time this happened and it wasn't a foregone conclusion, you know, and I think that, um, you know, I, I guess I'm I'm lucky that my family did have the confidence in me to 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 step into this role um, over quite a few years. I mean, I think it was eight or nine years before that that happened. Um, as it relates to, to to women trying to to navigate, I I think that you know I, we talked about being shy. I think the first thing is just to 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 raise your hand and let people know that you do want to to move uh, along the leadership, uh, you know, the kind of that leadership process because I think you know sometimes. You take that for granted that people just assume you can't you can't ever assume that so you know raise i always say raise your hand volunteer to do things and and i always say and you have the right to, to change your mind i think sometimes at a young age we feel like oh my gosh if i go this direction i'm i'm, I'm it's set in stone and i remember my first job i agonized over it right it's as if that was going to be my career for the rest of my life and i think we have to remind women in particular it's okay just try Try things, you know. It's okay to 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 change your mind along the way, and you know. Another good piece of advice I was told is, you know, if, as long as you're curious, you'll be successful in life. Because somebody told me once, For it's sure. better to be it's better to be tired than bored. And I think yeah. people that are that are curious <laughs> and are, are tired, they're not bored. You know, life is pretty interesting. And I think, you know, I think women in particular tell them just be curious, ask a lot of questions, but you know. Speak up. Tell people that you you want help and that you want to you want to have that that kind of success in your career. Yeah, it's like what they say, right? If you want something done, give it to somebody that's busy. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs>
Absolutely. It's kind of the same. Um, Maria, where do you see, with all your travels, all your research, all your observations, where do you see women leading in hospitality, not just in groups or culturally in certain parts of the world, but also specific women and examples? I mean, as, you, as you've traveled, you know, who's, who's really elevating, uh, the, who are the women that are elevating our, our industry? Well, I mean, there are women that a lot of us probably know, people watching who, who operate in the industry. I mean, I think of people, when I think of people who like, you know, I feel like Nikki Fitzgerald, um, just how much strength she's demonstrated, how fundamental she was to the development of luxury safari in Africa, in South Africa in particular, but then with and beyond, which used to be Conservation Corporation Africa, and you know, with daughters working with her now, and she's got her lodge. She's just always really, I felt the word powerhouse was tailor-made for her in the industry, you know. And Liz Biden, we talked about before, who runs the royal portfolio with Phil, her husband. But Liz is just, she has such a singular vision and is the the kindest, sweetest person also, and just gets a she lot. She makes it look done. so easy. <laughs> yeah, gets a lot done, but but works, I mean, like a stakhanovite, you know, like really, um, but without without being awful, without being something that, that somebody's going to confuse with something awful, you know, because there's also that old fabulous trope of like, a woman is a bitch and a man is just competent, you know? <laughs> Um, yeah, she was at our talk as well. I'm a big fan of Liz. She's phenomenal. She's it's, she's a superstar. Um, where it's kind of more fun, the thing I've noticed, and this is this is very much your wheelhouse, Lindsay and Tina. Like I remember when I first started in the industry, I was living in New York, and I we used to have to go to these junkets and these various events, and like Belmont would roll into town, and and all of the GMs were like 55 year old white guys with Hermes <laughs> ties on. You know, you were like. I can't tell you apart. And uh, it's rude. They all, a lot of them are super competent. And a lot of that's also to do with the model. You know, to be a successful GM, you had to be somebody who could up your family every four to six years and move halfway across the world. Yeah. And there was that that weird paradigm that established itself of the woman who was the trailing spouse who set up households and found the schools and all of that. And very rarely did you see that reversed. And I mean, in the big companies there, obviously like Amanda Heinemann at Mandarin Oriental has a huge leadership role and is an amazing person um, and was a very, very successful GM also. Uh, Olivia Richley, who runs Heckfield Place in England, who was at Amman for a very long time. Yes, she's fabulous. Um, she's fabulous also because she's really like, you know, she's not just an operations person, she's a tastemaker. They're, they're, they're these people who have these very holistic, you go there and you're like, this has the imprimatur of that person on it, every bit of that experience. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then there are some young, like there's, it's nice to see young, and I wonder, you know, there, there are young GMs, female GMs at sort of very small independent hotels. And I suspect even though their world is different and probably more evolved than the one I was in, because these are women who are sort of 15, 20 years younger than I am, that it's just easier for them than being in a larger company still to to find a pretty easy upward trajectory. Um, yeah. There's a there's a lovely, lovely hotel in Rome called the Villon here. And the woman who runs it, Giorgia Tozzi, is She's fabulous. Amazing. I adore her. The amazing. coolest woman ever. Oh, Giorgia is watching. Oh. Totally. We sent her a big kiss. She plus her fashion sense is phenomenal. Last time I saw her, exactly. I was like actually... the hotel. Like you go in there, it's yeah. you, you have that, and that there's this woman called Francesca Webster who runs Rays, which is like the coolest hotel in Australia. And they're just they take little places and do a lot with them, you know. Yeah. And it's kind of you and I, you and I touched on this when we spoke before before this meeting. When when you asked all three of us, sort of what advice would you give to young women who want to. Um, and maybe this is slightly cynical of me. I base it on my own experience and I'm 50 now. So maybe that's a bit outdated, but like find women to work for, you know, mm -hmm. look, look where it's happening. Go work for women. I mean, I was, you know, magazines were largely female run, female populated staff wise. It was a very female friendly um, profession to be in. 
newsrooms are different, although the editor of the Financial Times now is a woman, Rula Kalaf, who's the very definition of a powerhouse also. And How to Spend It is still edited by a woman, Joe Ellison. So there's a lot of there's there's a lot more parody, it, it, certainly in the FT newsroom, which is the only one I've worked in. But magazines were automatically a place where you felt like you were going to be surrounded by that. And advertising at the time was very much not, you know, that was a real. Yeah, and it's it is it is changing. And I think it's it, there's no doubt that we're moving in the right direction. Of course, we would all want to accelerate it, you know, like, you know, as I said, catapult the, the movement. Um, when we're we're first getting in getting to the end, and I always feel like we could sit here and talk for another three hours, uh, you know, open a bottle of wine or whatever it is. I'm in Mexico, so <laughs> it's great. like you know, it always feels like it's time to party. <laughs> yeah, but um, I wanted to ask all of you. Um, it's that's it's the same thing I ask every every all the, my panels at T, at the TL talks. You know, if everybody were to forget everything that was just said. What would be your final message? What would you like people to leave with, to think about, to ponder on over the weekend or beyond? Um, and because this is uh, about women, I would love also for you to touch upon um, what legacy do you want to leave behind with women or girls um, as your career moves on? Um, and maybe Tina, I'll start. I'll start with you. So, uh, you know, I want the, I want my daughter and I want that generation to have uh, a easier time and to reach the heights that they want to reach in their careers. And I'll share with you what I shared with her. So my daughter is 19, 19. Last year when she left home to go to college, I wrote her a letter and, and there are five, her, her name is Darcy. So there were five basic things that I told her each for, for each letter of her name. So D was for dare. And, and I talk about taking risks and, and, and really go, you know, putting yourself out there as a woman. And I think we all, we all need to do that. A is for acceptance and just being, you know, accepting, being tolerant that other people have opinions. R is for responsibility and really just taking responsibility for your actions. C is for courage. And I think women need to have a bit more courage and we need to push them. We need, they need a little bit of a nudge. And then why is you and just be authentically you. And to me, you know, that, that was my message to my daughter. And that, that is my message to young women, um, you know, as they embark on their careers. And, and that's what I believe with. And, and I can add, um, Tina, if I could predict the future and have your daughter on a future TL talk and ask her which woman is how, <laughs> in, you know, in, empowers her, it'll definitely be you. So there is no doubt about that for sure. Um, Maria, tell us a little bit, what's your final, final message? It, it's, if everything else got forgotten, just that, you know, we all work in travel everybody who goes out in the world should be thinking about this themselves. It's incumbent on travelers to observe women, if that's your, if, if it's sustainability, whatever it is, if you care about empowering women, ask questions, ask it of the people planning your travel, ask it of the places you're, the people who run the places you're staying. Um, you know, everybody has to bring a, a sense of responsibility to the issue. You know, I, I, I can observe and report and write and, and, and tell the stories, but then ultimately people need to be active and proactive in supporting that in other cultures, you know. For sure. And, and it goes for all of the topics, you know, I always make sure I'm yeah. very passionate about sustainability as well and yeah. diversity and, and it's everybody's responsibility. It's not, you know, about, you know, it's what can I do? What is my role? How am I impacting? Because We've talked about it in previous talks. Every decision you make is a choice, and it's meaning. There's a meaning behind it. You're sending yeah. a message to the universe. You're sending the message to the stakeholders, and so make sure you take you take time to to choose and choose wisely, right? Whatever it is that you're doing, whatever as often as you can, as often as you can, go find the women where you are. Talk yeah. to them. Engage with them. Find out what they want, what they need. Understand how their culture looks different and how paradigms of empowerment might look different and yeah, and yeah. you know how you can participate in that if that's your if that's your desire that's your want sure 
sure. No, so we had a few, like last month, I think it was last month, time is weird, but we did a big event uh, for the North American market. <laughs> it is weird. Nowadays, you don't know how, you know, how much time has gone by. But we did RepFest in collaboration with four other rep companies. And though we are small businesses, you know, and struggling, we made it non-for-profit and we gave over $10,000 to an amazing charity called Every Mother Counts which mm-hmm. is beautiful. And, and I think the, the idea of that was not only to be charitable, but to send a message, you know, to say, we, there's this, as Lindsay said, there's nothing wrong with making money and, and being profitable, but how profitable, you know, how much will it hurt you if you, if you give a bit and then you support and you elevate humanity in your actions. And I think it's, it's such a key message. And Lindsay, I'll let you take it home with your message. <laughs> Well, I don't have children of my own, but I have a lot of friends with a lot of young daughters and I love spending time with them. And I love that when I hear them say when they grow up, they want to be a CEO. So, I mean, I I think there's a legacy, you know, I think just setting that example, but I always tell them too, I be genuine. I tell them kindness is not a weakness either. And I think that there's something important about reminding women that, that, you know, we can, we can, be loving. I, I say lead with love, you know, and I think that that's not a very typical leadership statement. Um, and then I always to tell them, have fun. Never take your life so, never take yourself so serious. So I'll put it that way because I love what I do. I feel blessed that I get to get up and do this every day. And, and I think if you do follow your passion, and you're having fun, you will be successful. And, you know, I just think that that's an important thing to remind people all the time, especially women. Have fun. You know, really, I mean, and I think, and, and I agree, we all have to support each other and, and, and lead by example. So this has been such a, I do wish I had a glass of wine in my hand and that we could keep going. This would be fantastic. It's a little too early here. Tina, probably, yeah, it's probably it's like we're going to do this live. When, Tina, when you have to consume some mezcal for all of us because you're in the best place possible. I wasn't going to yes. do it, but Maria, because you said it, I'll do it because for I'm you. I'm insisting <laughs> that you can <laughs> mezcal. Yeah. Um, I think, you know, I, I can't thank you enough, all of you, for, for joining this talk. I think that the message that we're giving out, the example that each one of you is setting in everything we do is so, so important. Very often we're not aware of how much impact, you know, our words have um, and our actions have. And so, you know, be, I hope you feel a big hug and a big appreciation. I think it goes, it's almost like me, you know, 30 years down the line saying thank you so much, you know, backwards, looking at you and say, I wish you girls were there when I was smaller. And I'm very happy that my daughters, you know, I have a 12 year old and a two year old, but I'm sure that there's going to be so many more women uh, to lead the way. And it's going to make exactly as Tina said, their lives a little bit easier, whatever decision they take and wherever the path they choose. Um, So once again, ladies, thank you so much. It's been such an incredible pleasure. I'm so much looking forward to being able to celebrate with you in person at some point. I always commit to all my TL Talks. Eventually, we're all going to get together, all of these TL Talk panelists, and we're going to celebrate life and celebrate all the energy that we're sending out, which is so important. Um, So thank you once again. Have a great weekend. If you enjoy this, please share it and subscribe. We want to hit as many people with this positive energy. And again, it's not only women. We've had incredible men supporting this movement as well, so we can't forget to mention that. Mm Thank you, Tina. Thank you. you. We need to reconnect with our common humanity, understand that the diversity of our cultures and our different ways of life are absolutely what create the rich fabric. And in the same context with nature, the beauty of biodiversity, of our oceans, our mountains, our deserts, our jungles are what inspires us. When we borrow something, we should return it better than how we receive it. Sustainable travel is a virtuous cycle, whereas unsustainable travel is a vicious cycle. That was sort of the rule of that exchange. You needed to give it better and back in a better condition. Sustainability is not a religion. It's not all or nothing. You can do little things, you know, you can adapt to it slowly. You can incorporate it.